China's Falcon 9 copy just blew up during its landing attempt on its first flight. Yet somehow, it's still being hailed as a major success. Even more surprising, Elon Musk is openly cheering them on, saying their clone could surpass SpaceX's Falcon 9 within the next five years. So, what really happened up there? Why would Elon praise a competitor for copying his rocket? And does this thing actually stand a chance against the original? Let's break it all down in today's episode of Alpha Tech. They were this close, just a little bit more, to pulling off the very first flight of Zhuke 3, the rocket many people are calling China's Falcon 9 version 2. For a moment, it felt like the whole world was watching because this would have been China's first partially reusable rocket capable of landing itself. But things went south fast. During the return burn, the booster caught fire, lost control, and came crashing down. One big boom, and the whole vehicle was basically reduced to a pile of scrap metal. This rocket comes from Landspace, one of China's biggest private space companies. Their growth over the past few years has been comparable to SpaceX in the US, except for one big difference. SpaceX keeps climbing, while Landspace just took a massive hit. After the Juki 3 booster blew up on December 3rd, the company's stock tanked as investors started losing confidence in this Falcon 9 clone. But here's the twist. Even though the landing failed and the company's value dropped, Landspace is still celebrating, and they even got a compliment from Elon Musk. Why? Because China didn't live stream this mission, so we only saw part of the story. The truth is, before the booster exploded, it had already delivered the upper stage to orbit and successfully deployed a dummy payload. That alone is a massive milestone, something every rocket company in the world hopes to achieve. Take Blue Origin, for example. When they sent just two NASA satellites to orbit on New Glenn's second flight, it was considered a huge accomplishment, but China pulled it off on their very first attempt. That shows their copycat technology isn't something to underestimate, it's genuinely impressive. So impressive that Elon Musk himself praised them on X, saying, They have added aspects of Starship, such as use of stainless steel and methalox, to a Falcon 9 architecture, which would enable it to beat Falcon 9. That praise from Musk comes from the fact that Landspace cleverly picked some of Starship's best features and blended them into Juke 3, turning it into a hybrid between Starship and Falcon 9. But beyond the compliment, his message also reinforces his own position in the industry. Musk added, But Starship is in another league. He continued, If they are lucky, it might outperform Falcon in five years, by which time SpaceX will be launching Starship. In other words, even if China does manage to catch up with Falcon 9, by the time they get there, SpaceX will already be operating a completely different beast. Starship isn't just a rocket to put payloads into orbit, it can become an on-orbit refueling depot, a lunar lander, and even a transport vehicle for Mars. Meanwhile, Juke 3 is still chasing achievements SpaceX reached more than a decade ago, and there's no guarantee they can even match those. Because if you compare the maiden flights of Falcon 9 and Juke 3, China still has a long way to go before they can beat SpaceX. Let's rewind 15 years, back to June 2010. Falcon 9 V1 lifted off from Florida with the roar of nine Merlin engines carrying a test version of the Dragon capsule, not just a dummy payload. And just nine minutes later, the second stage delivered that capsule into low Earth orbit with precision. The mission was flawless. No explosions, no partial failures. And even without dramatic landings back then, Falcon 9 kept improving, becoming the incredibly reliable rocket we know today. With a near-perfect record, 583 launches as of the moment you're watching this video. And Juke 3 despite having a 15-year technological head start to learn from SpaceX and even adopting Starship's breakthrough design choices, the results are not very impressive. Its payload was just a set of dummy satellites, and the mission ended in an explosion. According to the initial reports, China only gave a very vague explanation, calling it simply an anomaly during the landing burn. That's all they said. The booster failed to achieve a soft landing and exploded just before touching down. But the footage tells a much clearer story. You can actually see flames erupting from the engine section and then engulfing the entire booster. That suggests two likely scenarios. First, the booster may have been descending normally with the grid fins stabilizing its fall, but then one engine, or an entire engine cluster, didn't restart properly. 
that mismatch and thrust would instantly throw off the balance, creating a swirling plume of super-hot plasma from the remaining engines. Once that happens, the fire becomes uncontrollable. The second possibility is software. The guidance system for a landing burn has to be precise down to the millisecond. Just a tiny deviation, one or two degrees off, or even a split-second delay in ignition caused by a temperature sensor or telemetry glitch can make the booster spin out of control. And with methylox involved, any instability can turn into a runaway fire. And that's exactly what we saw in the end. But at the end of the day, you still have to call this a successful flight. Now, at this point, a lot of people might still be wondering why Juke 3 is often described as an upgraded copy of Falcon 9. Think of Falcon 9 like a reliable sports car, about 70 meters tall, 3.7 meters in diameter, powered by nine Merlin engines burning kerosene and liquid oxygen. It can throw up to 22.8 tons into low Earth orbit on an expendable mission, or around 15 to 17 tons when the booster comes back for a landing using its grid fins and landing legs. Juke 3 basically copies that entire formula. It also uses nine engines, the TQ-12A, and it also aims to reuse the first stage with grid fins and landing legs. But here's the upgrade. Instead of kerosene, it runs on clean, cheaper liquid methane, the same fuel choice as Starship. That makes fast reuse easier and cuts costs. Its structure is built from stainless steel, not aluminum like Falcon 9. Again, that's straight out of the Starship playbook. Stronger, more heat resistant, and better suited for atmospheric re-entry. Even the dimensions feel like a hybrid, 66 to 76 meters tall depending on the version, and 4.5 meters wide, noticeably wider than Falcon 9. Thanks to that, the Block 2 version can haul about 21.3 tons to Elio, slightly edging out Falcon 9 when landing downrange. So in the end, Juki 3 isn't just copying Falcon 9 to compete on reliability and launch cadence. It's also absorbing bits of Starship's next-gen technology, Methalox fuel, stainless steel, in hopes of turning itself into a serious dark horse in the global launch market. And even though its first flight in 2025 reached orbit but ended in a booster explosion during landing, that's still a huge leap forward compared to the early failures we've seen across the rocket world. That's exactly why Elon Musk praised them, and it wasn't just empty compliments. Musk has always openly supported competition from rivals like Landspace, because he believes a crowded arena is what accelerates progress in space technology. Think about it. Competition works like a marathon, where every runner has to keep improving just to stay in the race. SpaceX proved this. Falcon 9 only became cheaper and more reliable thanks to pressure from companies like Blue Origin and Rocket Lab. And now, with Juki 3, that same competitive push is coming from China. It forces SpaceX to keep refining its reuse process, cut launch costs even further, and maybe even inspires new ideas, like optimizing methylox systems to fly faster and farther. The result? The entire space industry wins. We get more commercial flights, more innovation, and a future where space isn't just for research anymore. It becomes a place for tourism, exploration, and one step closer to the dream of settling on Mars. If Juke 3 hits a few big milestones soon, like nailing its first booster landing on the next flight or eventually reaching 20 reuses, then the dream of a true Chinese Falcon could finally become real. Launch costs might drop below $10 million per mission, and China's upcoming satellite mega constellations like Guowang would benefit enormously. But even with all that potential, Juki 3 still faces a massive uphill climb before it can threaten Falcon 9, a rocket that has already earned its crown. Falcon 9 has flown 583 missions with a 99.5% success rate, suffering only three failures since 2010. Its internal cost per launch sits somewhere around 30 to $40 million, largely thanks to boosters being reused up to 31 times. At this point, Every Falcon 9 launch is basically a money printing machine for SpaceX, fueling more than 155 missions just this year alone. And the market advantage is even harder to match. The Western commercial launch sector is booming, powered by thousands of Starlink satellites per year, and a steady stream of contracts from NASA, ESA, and major telecom players. Meanwhile, Asia, despite growing at roughly 16% annually, is still far behind. 
Most Chinese rocket contracts are limited to domestic customers and a handful of regional partners. Breaking into the global market is extremely difficult due to geopolitical barriers and trust issues that foreign clients simply can't overlook. Even if Juki 3 perfects reusability, it's still following a path SpaceX mastered over a decade ago, grid fins, RTLS landings, rapid turnaround. There's nothing groundbreaking yet, nothing that forces the industry to rethink what's possible. If Landspace truly wants to surpass SpaceX, copying Falcon 9 won't be enough. They would need to leapfrog to the next frontier, the Starship class, and somehow do it better. Because Starship is already charging ahead at full speed. Just look at the progress at Starbase. Ship 39 is now deep into assembly inside Mega Bay 1, and it already looks surprisingly complete, from the fully tiled TPS to the overall structure. This new design even integrates the orbital refueling system, one of the most critical features of the upgraded Starship generation. But here's the catch. Ship 39 still has to go through the full testing pipeline. And considering how dramatic the jump was from booster version 2 to version 3, Ship 39 is likely facing a similar level of redesign. That's why SpaceX built a dedicated test tank, S39.1, created specifically to validate the new aft section structure before testing the real vehicle. The problem is, S39.1 hasn't even started testing yet which means SpaceX currently has no test data at all on the structural changes of Ship 39. Going straight into a full cryo test without that data would be a big gamble. But let's be honest, SpaceX is known for moving fast and cutting steps when needed. They might skip S39.1 entirely or run only a quick round of checks before jumping straight to testing Ship 39 itself. If they go with that move fast, break stuff approach, Ship 39 could realistically be ready to fly as soon as February. If they followed the traditional, safer testing route, then it's much harder to imagine how they could move that fast. Either way, Ship 39 marks a major leap forward. It represents an entirely new generation of Starship, optimized for mass production, redesigned from the ground up, and packed with important upgrades aimed at much larger missions in the years ahead.